right. Cool. Um, well, so uh, welcome to our, uh, our panel on deploying AI and BC challenges and opportunities. Um, I guess we've uh, got a, uh, an hour to, to speak with a distinguished panel of representatives of uh, industry and academia um, here in British Columbia um, across both uh, UBC and SFU. And uh, we're going to speak to them about uh, where they see um, you know, the AI impacting their industries in, in the near future, the opportunities that they see in BC, and some of the challenges that they're, uh, they're working on. Um, for each, uh, and then after that, we're gonna of course open this up to, to questions from all of you and have a bit of a discussion with, um, with all of you, um, which I, I hope we have the, the technical wherewithal to do. Um, so let me begin by, uh, by asking the panel to invite them uh, to introduce themselves, um, maybe to, to make that easy, I'll, um, I'll call on the panels one by one um, in the order that I see them in my grid, which may or may not be what they see. Uh, so, so Greg, why don't you go first? Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, my name is Greg Mori. I'm a professor at Simon Fraser University. I work on computer vision and machine learning. I've been a professor there for about 16 years. And two and a half years ago, I joined Borealis AI. And I'm currently full time there as a senior research director uh, building AI based products for financial services. Quick backgrounder, I mean, I've, I've worked on vision and learning for quite a long time. But um, over that, that 16 years, I also worked with a lot of different startup companies. And I've you know, nine of them has sort of the count so far. And there have been a lot of great stories and adventures along the way. And I've always been really excited about um, building products from the, the AI research that we do. And I'm, I'm excited to be part of this panel and, and hear more about different perspectives. Thanks, uh, Ali. Hi, good morning. My name is uh, Ayin Tahuk. I am an assistant professor in obstetrics and gynecology at UBC. So I work on developing clinical predictive models in women's health, particularly in uh, oncology, in gynecological oncology. Uh, I'm also the director of clinical informatics, data science, um, and outcomes research with the OFCARE BC's gynecological cancer research team. Thanks, uh, Douglas. Hi, I'm Douglas Kingswood. I'm the Provincial Chief Medical Information Officer with Ministry of Health. I'm one of the leadership team with the Provincial Digital Health Strategy, and I co-chair the Digital Health Strategy Office, which holds the enterprise architecture function um, for the sector. My, my background is I'm a family physician, but I also have an engineering PhD in AI. Thanks, uh, Yevgeny. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me on this panel. Uh, I'm the Chief Technology Officer of the Digital Technology Supercluster, and uh, my background is in mathematics and computer science. And before coming to the supercluster, I spent uh, quite some years, about 25 years in digital health. So maybe both of my examples will be in health, um, helping Douglas in, uh, in that area. Thank you, uh, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. I'm Matt Taddy. I'm a, uh, currently I work at Amazon. My title is Vice President for Economic Technology. We build um, reinforcement learning systems essentially for automation of all of the various things that Amazon does from logistics to business processes to what you see on the front of the website to how boxes move around. Um, prior to working at Amazon where I've been for about three years now, uh, my background is in academia. I, um, as a statistician, I was at the University of Chicago for 10 years um, and I've also worked at a number of other uh, tech companies, big, small startups, and everything in between. So, and I'm a, a BC native, and we're you know doing a bunch of stuff in Vancouver right now. So I'm really excited to be uh, back part of this community. Thank you, uh, Frank. Hi, Kevin. Uh, my name is Frank Wood. I'm an associate professor of computer science at uh, UBC. Uh, I guess one of those CFAR AI chairs at Mila. Uh, the Chief Science Officer at Inverted AI. Uh, and before here, I work on probabilistic methods and statistical machine learning. Before here, I was a professor at Oxford and uh, a professor of statistics at Columbia. And I did it the other way around to most everybody here, which is to say that I was an entrepreneur for a long time before I became an academic um, and ran a, ran a bunch of companies that, that did okay. And I'm very happy to be in BC uh, uh, playing with uh, you all trying to build uh, build the uh, the local infrastructure. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, finally, we have Cal, 
who I can't hear. Uh, you're going to need to unmute yourself. Yep. Uh, I'm Cal Ruberg. I'm the Vice President of Future and uh, Chief Innovation Officer for Tech Resources. Um, a little bit about my background. Uh, it's been a little bit in mining with Placer Dome before that, and uh, but uh, mostly within the AI field since the 1980s. Um, uh, deep background was with the Media Lab or the Architecture Machine at MIT, uh, then with uh, uh, the National Labs down in the US doing a lot of simulation work and learning. Uh, work as well as with uh, IBM and uh, then uh, then to TELUS and uh, Deputy Minister in Manitoba and CIO there. Um, so, uh, you know, a, a very a sort of meandering career, if you wish. Uh, very pleased to be part of this very august uh, collection of folks and uh, um, I look forward to the discussion. I think BC is home to me, is home for me now. Uh, I, I've lived in, in many places, but uh, it is uh, the most wonderful place on the planet. So I, you know, what, you know, why would nobody, why would anybody not want to come here? Is is a question. Great, thank, thanks all. What a great panel. We have uh, representatives from different universities, computer scientists, health researchers, statisticians, government representatives, mining, health, you know, e-commerce. I, I think this is a great cross-section uh, of, of what's going on in BC and the, the different perspectives. So I'm excited to begin. Uh, I, I realize I didn't introduce myself, so let me do that. Uh, I'm Kevin Layton Brown. I'm the director of CADA, a professor in computer science uh, at University of British Columbia. And uh, my research is on um, machine learning uh, applied both to economic systems and to the design and analysis of algorithms. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm excited to begin. Uh, let's, let's get going. So uh, I'd like to, to begin by setting the stage by uh, thinking about the near future of artificial intelligence, uh, particularly as um, you, you see it impacting your own uh, industry or research area. Um, so I'd like to ask you where you see AI having the most immediate impact and uh, where you see it having the biggest upside um, you know, in your personal corner of the world. Uh, and conversely, where, where you see the biggest challenges, you know, again, in this kind of near future deployment of AI in, in your space. So, um, we'll give each panelist a chance to respond to that prompt, and then we'll we'll have a, a bit of a free for all. Uh, so I'll, I'll let you guys uh, just kind of buzz in by putting your hands up, but uh, I'll be unafraid to call on you if you uh, if nobody volunteers. So uh, so so nobody's going for it. So I feel like Matt looks like oh, looks like it. oh there you go, Cal. All right. Well, I mean, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't typically associate mining with AI. Um, and and uh, it, it you know it, it comprises of a fairly um, uh, robust uh, system of removing uh, or moving earth and processing it and so um, but it's actually very com complex because the the earth itself has, has, is is complicated in the sense that you, you don't just find like a bunch of copper in the earth it, it, it's very yeah, unevenly distributed and so your your warehouse if you will is completely uncharacterized and you can't characterize it uh, evenly. And so um, uh, to process this, you, you really do need to um, uh, understand the patterns of processing that are, that are the most efficient. And these are fairly complex. Uh, and uh, not only that, but actually, how do you actually mine it uh, physically and, and extract it? And uh, throughout that whole system, there are so many variables and, and, and these change over time so quickly uh, that uh, you know, it's impossible for a human being to actually capture all of this. And so to that end, we started a program called Race 21. Uh, it really looks at renewing our entire digital infrastructure, our IoT infrastructure, gathering the data, creating the pipelines into over 90 uh, uh, machine learning applications uh, to help people really process these things faster. And actually, um, all of these projects are based on the value return to the company, on actually increasing the EBITDA of the company in a very, very significant way. And, and that's sort of uh, what's going on at tech and, 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 and how we're applying, uh, particularly machine learning more than anything else uh, to, this, uh, to these problems. So I'll, I'll, piggy, I'll go on uh, after Cal, because you called on me, Kevin. But also, also I can piggyback off of what he said, which, uh, you know, uh, Cal, you said, you, know, you might not think of mining as the obvious place for AI applications. Where I see the biggest upside right now is in those non-obvious applications. So, you know, I look at a lot of uh, the, the things that you might think a tech company uses AI and ML for, 
uh, you know, the, the things that we know about like search, for example, right? And yes, there's lots of uh, good AI and ML tech going into those types of traditional applications. But where the biggest upside is are in the spaces where we have business processes, operation processes, um, and there's existing automation, but we haven't managed to go in and chop them up into machine learning uh, problems and the sort of intelligent data-based automation that, that, um, that this, people on this panel know about. So yeah, whether it's mining or whether it's you know, uh, uh, shipping, whether it's uh, uh, all of the sort of things that right now we are not uh, even starting to work with um, AI on. That's where the big upside is. And it's also the most difficult stuff because you need to basically take processes that might not be uh, natively engineered around automation and think one, how do you make this into a framework for automation? And two, how do you then have the automation depend upon the machine learning? Thanks, Matt. Who wants to go next? Cool. Um, you, you can raise your hands in, in the, the participants list, by the way, if you so choose, but I see your, your physical hand, Douglas. So why don't you go ahead? Uh, so um, my focus is on the health system. So the, the, the challenge we have is increasing health system capacity. So um, some of the areas that I think have immediate impact are tooling that will help us triage patients um, without having to be a human involved. Interpretation of data streams is a big uh, focus on trying to keep people um, well at home instead of in hospital and keeping them in better health when they have chronic disease. So increasingly sophisticated interpretation of data streams, big near-term uh, wins, lots of stuff on image interpretation. I think the big upsides um, are around process automation and that's really about scaling health system capacity. And the big challenges that I see are around data governance, um, a lot of problems around change management and also around streamlining processes to get innovation into production. So that's the privacy, security assessments, ethics re um, review um, and technical architecture conformance with, with platforms. A lot of, um, a lot of uh, barriers around the change management piece particularly. Thanks, Adeline. So uh, I'm also in the health sector and I would say uh, the biggest opportunities is uh, we need to bring AI to the point of care as quickly as possible and start really closing the gap between developing models and seeing them applied in practice and, and sort of blending uh, the uh, quality improvement with innovation. And I think uh, in BC, we need to really start sitting and having the hard conversations around privacy and ethics and what it would take uh, to bring these models to the point of care without compromising uh, patients, without pro compromising their health and without compromising their privacy. And I think having these conversations up front and setting this up uh, really provides us a, a big opportunity to start seeing uh, these models implemented in a very sort of thoughtful way as opposed to just haphazardly. Thanks, so you have yeah, I wanted to continue on the health side uh, and uh, actually looking at the, at the near future, probably the easiest way is to, uh, to just look at the, at the present and see uh, how this projects because when, as they say, um, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. So um, I come from the medical imaging and I'll give some examples of this. Like um, 20 years ago, um, radiologists used to uh, dictate their reports and then a transcriptionist just writes down the report and then the radiology signs the report. Have you heard any job posting for transcriptionists in the last 15 years? There isn't. There was, uh, everything is done by an NLP. I mean, it's not AI, but that's exactly what, I, uh, what these guys have been doing in the um, speech uh, recognition. And, and if you look at today, uh, it's because it didn't change the workflow. It's actually allowed to improve the workflow flow without asking the parties to change something for the radiologist is still the same. The guy still dictates, gets the reports, signs it. Why did, didn't this happen in some other um, verticals in, in critical space? And people, as far as the, the recent studies are, 55% of their time, of physicians' time, is spent in data entry. Big, I mean, this is because they will need to change their workflow. So what are the areas where um, AI can add value to the workflow without necessarily disrupting it? We've got an interesting project again in the imaging space in, um, in the supercluster, which a company called uh, OneCubit is leading. And they have an interesting set of algorithms that detect um, 
uh, X-ray chest abnormalities. And what they actually do is that they analyze the images in the background and they attach an annotation object to the image, to the study. And when the radiologist looks at them, well, he just has an additional information, say, look at that image. There is a possible pulmonary embolism in here. So it's actually adding information without changing things uh, to, the, uh, to the end user. So I think that the near future will be in places where there are some of those additions that don't necessarily disrupt the entire workflow, but add value so that they can be more easily accepted. Thanks. Uh, I guess we, there's two of you left. Who wants to go for it? I could answer a question in the Q&A. Is that okay, panel chair? Someone, so, someone asked you, it falls down. I think on what, what Matt was saying, I really loved Matt's answer about, about these non-obvious applications in a sense. And someone on the on the QA asked, you know, how can an AI CS student get into non-obvious applications without prior experience in those domains? And I think that's a really, really great question. My my answer to that would be that we do that in teams. So we, we have multidisciplinary teams where you know at, at Borealis, we're part of RBC, really, really large, successful bank. Um, I don't know a lot about banking, to be honest. I'm learning about it. I go talk with my partners in RBC. They teach me about their problem domain. As an AI researcher, these opportunities that come up, my job is to formulate them as machine learning problems. And I, I think that that's a skill that, that AI CS students usually have acquired during their training. They're, they're good at sort of formulating a problem that is a bit vague and it's not clear exactly how it is a machine learning problem, you can do that. And the way that you do that is by talking to, to other humans, people who work and are domain experts. And it's super fun. I get to learn about banking. I get to work with those colleagues of mine and I try to add value by, by formulating things in this way. Um, and the engineering of those solutions is quite similar as well. You know, what are engineers good at? Often they're good at requirements gathering. You sort of need to understand what are the requirements for this solution and this type of partnership where we work with people in those domains. And I see this in the financial services industry. There are tons of these non-obvious applications that from the outside, you wouldn't expect that there's this business process that currently has rules that are handcrafted. And when you see that, you think as a computer scientist, that should be automated. And as a machine learning person, you say, I can learn how to do that. Lots of caveats about how dangerous that can be, and you have to be super careful about how you're learning to do that. But those are the opportunities, and you do that in partnership. I mean, is, is this emerging as a subtle point of disagreement between what you and maybe Matt are saying and what Evgeny was advocating? I mean, I guess I heard Evgeny saying it was really important not to change workflow. Well, it's mostly for the acceptance. It's a lot easier to get this into the uh, into the hands of the users if they don't have to turn everything upside down. It's about the near future. Of course, in, in the longer term or midterm even, some things will be totally disrupted. We don't have to fool ourselves, but it's a lot easier to just add value and it's accepted immediately to the workflow and it changes the workflow in a minimal way, if possible, when it gets the value produced at the end of the day uh, additionally. I'd love to hear Matt's perspective on this. For me, it's like they're interfaces, like at different levels of detail, you're going to disrupt a workflow, but yeah. maybe at the kind of the API level that you're exposing to some client or some internal customer, they don't see a change in what's happening, but behind that, there will be process changes. We see this more generally in, in health with even just digitizing processes. So there's a tendency to, rip, to, to create digital equivalents of, of archaic paper-based processes. And so to get to get change adopted, it's exactly what Jenny's saying uh, in health, you, you've got to min minimally change the existing workplace, but really you've got to then re-engineer those processes to optimally use the, the, the technologies you have available, but that's a much harder barrier. I think also and, there's yeah, no, a oh, shift that maybe uh, needs to happen as well, right? Like we've been used to relying on these systems, on the, on, 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 the artificial intelligence being part of our day-to-day -day lives. And I think we've accepted it in many aspects of our lives, banking being a great example, not so much in other areas where we're still kind of a little bit hesitant. And I think there's gonna be a bit of a cultural shift and that needs to happen slowly and bit by bit, uh, engaging people, uh, trial and error, and then just moving things forward slowly. Yeah, I think in some industries that's true, particularly in healthcare where uh, you know there's, there's a great, 
great concern, obviously, when you're changing uh, the processes. Um, in mining, this you know this may actually happen far faster in, in, in terms of a step change. Uh, you know, we're, we're we're aiming for zero GHG emissions in mines at this point in time in a very short amount of time, like th less than thirty years. And and uh, to to achieve that, we're we're going to need not only um, AI, you know, uh, AI, but but uh, you know, the, the completely disrupted types of systems to extract extract minerals and process them. And, um, and I think that, th that I'm not sure that we're capable about even doing that without some kind of external force like an Elon Musk saying, well, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna create my own mind because I think I can do it better. And you know, he's shown what he can do with SpaceX and, and, he, and he will do it with anything that he touches. And so you know, the thing is that there are, there are disruptors in the world that you know, if they turn their focus on your industry, they will change it dramatically. And, and they will change it using AI and, and they will change it using any method they can. Yeah, I, I, so I agree with all of it. I, I appreciate Kevin uh, introducing a little bit of friction and controversy. I think this is one of those cases where um, we have examples where you really don't wanna change the process, right? So where there's significant human computer interaction, which is the, you know, what I'm reading as the situation in healthcare um, you know, I think a lot about change management and launch uh, and those. You, you also have systems where much of what's going on is back end already and it's back end and behind rules. And in those scenarios, you can just rip it out and replace. Um, but there, there, so, so it's a spectrum there. Whenever one of the hardest things about launching full scale AI is the change management um, and also scaling up performance. Uh, because these things depend upon data and they learn over time. And so, you know, there's, there's things that we think about all the time, such as, is there an opportunity to fall back to the status quo? Um, and that's something that might help when there's significant human computer interaction, when the human gets confused or it's not working, they can fall back to their original way. But it's also something that applies to back end systems where, hey, these heuristic rules that were developed over time, they might look like nonsense to the new person coming in, but when you start removing them, you quickly fall, you know, step on, put your foot in something and realize that, oh, there's, you know, 20 years worth of uh, uh, folklore that led to this being here. And it's good folklore. It's based on some real experiences. So um, I think the, the main point is you just have to take a lot of care in change management and, and launch whenever you're uh, moving to a new system. And you got to think about that as as important as what you're, what you're developing um, as the end state. Uh, let's bring Frank into the conversation. We made it almost all the way around and, uh, and Frank hasn't yet uh, spoken to his point of view. So take it away, Frank. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> thanks, Kevin. I'm not, <laughs> I, I feel uh, oddly, um, uh, you know, like some sort of weird counterpoint in this, uh, in, in this, uh, in this entire discussion, um, you know, I'm uh, if I'm perfectly honest, I'm a, I'm I'm a little I'm a little depressed by it. If 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 I can if if I can be so honest, right? I mean, there's a bunch of incredibly talented people that are on this uh, on this 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 panel, uh, and we're sort of like um, we're succumbing to um, you know sh short termism. We're succumbing to um, uh, uh, high discount factor kinds of reasoning. Now, I, I know it's your favorite question to ask, and I, it's a frustrating question for, for you to ask, Kevin, which is like, what's the, the what's the short term, the near term thing that's going to happen in AI, and how is it going to be transformative in, in the near, very very near term? But I, I think that this implies, uh, and 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 it's reflected in in the in the panelists' responses, a, a discount factor that's way way too high as far as I'm concerned, and I think it's 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 uh, overlooking. You know, of course, we can, of course, we can talk about business processes and and supervised learning and a little bit of reinforcement learning and auto ML and how it's going to transform healthcare and and Amazon. But we're not really talking about AI. We're not talking about the really, really hugely transformative, you know, uh, you know, uh, artificial general intelligence. Uh, you know, like 
serious, serious research stuff. And there are people on this panel that definitely know about this stuff and should talk about it and, and should admit that we're closer than we've ever been to achieving some of this stuff that would be absolutely ridiculously transformative. Not talking about like making the number of Rolexes to, you know, it, available in the nearest Amazon warehouse slightly better uh, balanced or like, you know, putting a certain tag on an x-ray image using supervised learning with, you know, 10,000 labels and domain adaptation. I'm talking about multi-agent models and true actual reasoning systems and these sorts of things. And I'll go out on a limb and I'll say, screw it. You guys' uh, you know, discount factors are all wrong. Who cares about all this stuff? We actually have the tools and technology that in the near term, within our lifetimes for sure, everything's going to change. Everything's okay. got to change. So, so to take place. note, Frank's startup is not interested in making money in any realistic time horizon. He's building a boy who can truly love. Um, <laughs> what, what do the rest of you think about this? Well, you look at you look at SpaceX, and and, and there's your model. I mean, you know, yeah, this, this is Elon Musk of and Vancouver, there's a, and, there's a, and, it's, and it's a really good model because you have you have two companies. One is a traditional company that does exactly what many of us are sort of saying, you know, we'll go slowly and then we'll take the next step and we'll use everything that we used before. And I'm not, I'm not going to name the, the company, but they're not even certified to fly yet. And their cost per seat for astronaut is $100 million. And then you have Musk going, well, I don't think so. I'm going to build a new rocket engine that's going to completely change what, how we're going to do this. And, and, you know, at $55 million a seat, He's, he's in space and, and delivering people and, and, and junk up there. And, and so, uh, you know, I mean, he, he, you know, uh, uh, that's, that is what is happening. And, and it, takes, it takes very, very, very um, uh, strong individuals to push that vision through uh, within industries or even, you know, across industries. And if you, you know, if you even look at the Tesla and you walk around their factory, there are 400 programmers and there are 40 people on the floor. Well, so I guess we're, we're trying to talk about your perspectives, you know, in your industries here in BC, right? So, so is, you know, does Frank's vision resonate with, you know, day-to-day -day life at, you know, your, you know, respective points of view here in BC? Yeah, go ahead. I'd like to make just one, one remark. I mean, I, I certainly started that trend of the non-disruptive uh, uh, thing, but uh, I agree with Frank that we are a lot closer to some of the things that he says. But when you look at reality and see, for example, how much NLP is being used in daily life, which we can, the reality is different. And I would say for the natural resources industry, you guys do the sampling in using a models and methodology of the 60s program. At least that's what I heard. If AI tells you where to go and drill in order to be able to do the sampling and do that will be way very, very, very much better. Right. But you can do it with the old model. So it's 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 a question of, of adaptability and mm -hmm. how can we actually more pragmatically use what we already have into the places where it will actually be seen as adding value. I mean, there's also the danger of moving too quickly and not thinking carefully about what we're doing and not going, not being able to go back. And that is something that we really need to thread very carefully, particularly uh, in the health domain. And I think that I definitely like uh, having models work in parallel at first so that we could fully evaluate them, so that we could fully assess them before we start relying on them. And I think that's kind of like a prudent way of doing it. So even though the technology may be there, does not mean we need to adopt it immediately, full-fledged, automated, ready to go on its own. I think Frank's presenting a false uh, dichotomy here, right? So you, you just because we develop, uh, what did you call it, Kevin, the boy who loves, and like the full AGI, it doesn't mean that large scale operations and business processes are going to go away, right? So, um, it, you know, and when I think about things, it's all about how can I take whatever, you know, the best, the greatest, whatever technology is out there and fit it into uh, what I need to automate and scale. And so, um, you know, I, I haven't fully wrapped my head around the set of applications for what people would call general intelligence or, or, or AGI, but I think there's, uh, there's a little bit of a separation between um, 
or sorry, there, there's a there's a false separation between the pace at which you can move and get new tools and then how you can use these things. I mean, we're still going to want, we're still going to have mines, we're still going to have uh, shipping, we're still going to have health, we're, we're going to have all of these things. And so I think the it, it's fascinating and interesting if we can go fast and uh, you know, figure out how to use these new advances in AGI. I think that's fantastic. I, I agree with Aileen as well, which was what I was saying about change management and launch. I, I think we need to think as much about how we introduce the technology as what, what uh, the technology is going to be. But I think it's super exciting if we are, you know, closer to new ways of thinking about what AI means, because that opens up whole new vectors for intelligent automation. I think you make a, a good point. I mean, if I sort of try to paraphrase what you said, it sounds like you know business processes might not be sexy, but they, they sure are pretty important to the way our world is organized. And you know, upending right. those might might not be quite so short termist as as all that. Um, I think another just important to build on that also how we evaluate for technology, right? So I think right now we don't have a good battery of tests that we need to pass. We don't, have a, we don't have a process or a system to evaluate these technologies and bring them into practice. So uh, I think that there's gonna be a lot of work that's needed into developing these systems and developing a pathway uh, for AI to come to the, to the clinic. And I, again, I speak of this industry because that's the one that I'm uh, in and I'm most familiar with, but you know, there, there, there needs to be a lot of investment about how do we validate these, what is realistic to do, and what is, what is optimistic and what is realistic. And yeah, just, to build, just to build on that, in, in health, like long before we get to AGI, there's, um, there's, there's a, a huge number of quite simple problems that really could be benefited um, by the application of what we already know how to do, but it's, it's just not happening at scale. And the change management issues are, are, are much more impacting than the technology limitations at the moment. Um, I, I think in BC, if we can really focus on how can we actually deliver so solutions to system problems that are perhaps not sexy, but they're really impacting in terms of sector capacity, um, that, that's huge opportunity there. So, so, so it seems to me, that's a great segue to the next thing I want to talk about. So, um, you know, we have on the one hand, the sort of exciting vision of AI, the sort of challenge of, you know, trying to think about, uh, you know, the, the transformative changes that are you know, underway. Uh, on the other hand, you know, we really have our, our firm focus on BC here. I really want to think about um, you know, what our strengths specifically are you know, here in the province, um, you know, how we're likely to differentiate going forward from other kind of AI ecosystems in, in Canada and the US and abroad, and you know, how you know, the attendees you know, who are, you know, represent a broad cross-section of people with a professional interest in AI you know, here in BC um, can, can engage. So what, uh, what, what should students be excited about? What, what kinds of jobs are growing in BC? What, what should people be learning about? So, so what, what's your perspective on, on the, uh, the local BC scene in AI? I could go first. Um, Please. I think the, um, the, there's, we're, we're building out a, a connected ecosystem with, with data pipelines and dealing with the governance and, and, and um, legal authorities issues around, around amassing the data that's required to, to build these tools. We're also building out a structure where we'll be able to support testing solutions at, at scale in a distributed way across the, the, the health sector and, and, and evaluating properly and then rapidly scaling tools that, that works. I think BC is gonna be a great place to work on health uh, in terms of proving out those technologies and scaling them. And we just have to figure out the mechanics of how we're going to do that innovation collaboration. But that's that's near term, um, near term focus that we could work on together. And I think I'll add to that that BC has one of the best health, uh, data ecosystems in the world uh, because we are a single payer health system. Uh, there's a big drive, and again, I get always so encouraged when I hear uh, Dr. Kingsford's presentations about all the work that's been going on into, into making this data more accessible and more shareable. And I think uh, adding to that the education element, so really educating, um, you know, and again in health, educating the clinicians on how to interact with, with, with machine learning experts, with engineers, so that they are able to collaborate on projects that would, would, would tap into this amazing infrastructure. And again, I think we have the clinical talent here in BC uh, and the data, and I think we're, it's just a, basically an environment that's gonna be really, really ripe for innovation. 
maybe I could comment on the things that uh, I have seen going through the supercluster because that's a very good indicator of what we have as, as local strengths. And um, of course, I understand a little bit the imaging side better, but we have seen quite a lot of uh, focus on imaging, not only just in medical space, but uh, companies like uh, Meta Optima, one qubit that I mentioned, uh, extract.ai, compression.ai, by the way, also that works on uh, uh, ML based uh, image compression for multispectral imaging. Terra Mera doing very, very interesting things in computer vision. And actually, computer vision is probably one of the interesting areas that ties not only the companies, but also the uh, universities. I mean, SVU has a very good group. A very interesting project that recently uh, got um, uh, finished in the supercluster was. Uh, using the computer vision ML uh, in, the, in the context of um, uh, artificial uh, or, or augmented reality for inspection of aircrafts uh, together with Boeing. Um, an, another one that comes from UBC, and that's the one that I have um, more uh, deeper visibilities, is from the robotics and, uh, uh, and automation lab that is on point of care ultrasound in uh, enabling local companies who are producing the transducers actually to uh, power this with AI and give it in the hands of uh, uh, general practitioners to do specialized exams. And already 50 of those devices have been deployed in, uh, in rural communities. So I think there's a lot in healthcare, a lot of, in the imaging and computer vision space, but certainly a lot in the uh, natural resources. And, uh, and certainly what Matt was mentioned is a lot of background processes are based on heuristics. So replacing those heuristics with uh, some more modern tools based on ML and AI is, is a huge opportunity locally because, because there is the demand side. There is actually immediately the companies that can come and put it into practice. Whether it's gonna be in mining or it's gonna be in forestry or it's gonna be in, even in agriculture, there are the companies who are willing to take this and put it into practice. Uh, so a bit of housekeeping. Uh, we've got about 20 minutes left or a little bit less, a bit more than 15 minutes. Uh, we're going to move to audience questions in a few minutes. So uh, in the question and answer tab, which is different from the chat tab, uh, please uh, ask questions you'd like to see answered. And, and more importantly, please upload questions that others have asked that you'd like to see answered. We'll get to a few of those in a minute. Uh, let, let's keep going around the panel and, and talking about uh, you know, BC. And I guess in particular, I really I'd like to encourage all of you to focus on you know, what should attendees take away, right? We have a lot of students, faculty, representatives of different industry. You know, what, is, what do you think they need to hear about what's going on at BC? Well, I, I mean, at Tech, we're, we're building an enormous uh, uh, program. Um, we have literally hundreds of data scientists who are being hired. And, and, and uh, I know that Amazon uh, perhaps isn't happy with that, but but uh, at the same time, uh, you know, it, it, produ it provides an opportunity for, for a, a huge number of graduates from, from UBC. And it also provides an opportunity for uh, graduates in engineering disciplines um, or other disciplines to actually uh, engage uh, in this endeavor. And, and I'd, I'd like to sort of point out that the, the discussion around, um, you know, keeping the process and, and disrupting the process is actually one that is um, evolutionary. And so, while we have built you know, 90 applications in ML that, that actually are fairly granular and don't change any of the, or, or change very little of the workflow, the next step on that is, well, you have to build a systemic capability to control that entire system of, of autonomous uh, thinking. And that next level is a far more challenging level and a far more, uh, um, shall we say, uh, CS uh, challenging level as well is that it's a systemic view and, and one that actually projects into the future either through simulation or through some combination. And so, you know, so, so it is an, a stepwise function of granularity to far more um, a holistic view of, of, of a system. I'll just, I'll just answer one thing Cal said, which actually I think it's awesome if tech goes and hires 100 or you should hire 500 data scientists, honestly. But, um, the, and, uh, the, you know, when I, when I think about Vancouver and my experience, my short experience in hiring up there, um, you know, the, getting the density, not just of, say, data scientists or machine learning specialists, but people in the adjacent careers that are necessary for scaling these things, software developers who are familiar with large scale optimization and the sort of tool sets that you need for machine learning. But less obviously, 
you know, product managers who understand how to treat artificial intelligence or machine learning or reinforcement learning in my world applications as products, program managers who understand how to map from processes uh, to, um, uh, to, to ML problems and how to think about, you know, what are, what are gold standards? What are the right metrics? What are the right ways to evaluate performance um, and safety, like to Aileen's earlier point when you're using these systems. So, and you only get that by having a big uh, group of companies, not a single company, but a large group of companies, startups, big companies, um, and often the big companies act as training grounds for the startups, right? So um, I think more, more of everybody on this panel and people in the, the audience hiring up in these fields and also taking seriously how you need the, to support um, you know, the, the machine learning in industry. It's not just hiring a bunch of data scientists, it's all the adjacent careers and creating that deep, deep set of skills. Um, I think it's great. I mean, in Seattle, my office is across the street from Google and I'm kitty corner to Facebook. And uh, there's all sorts of other, you know, Microsoft's across the lake. Uh, and I think it's great. We have an awesome, awesome community and, you know, deep set of expertise in not just ML, but in the adjacent fields that you need to actually build ML products. So, so Matt, is this something that, you know, we cross our fingers and hope that it happens organically? Or, you know, it, is there some kind of top-down action needed here? Uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it is not something that happens organically. It's also something that no matter how much top down, you know, otherwise there'd be a Silicon Valley in a Seattle in every city, right? Because politicians all want it. They all want to do those sorts of things. So, um, you know, there, there's things that can help um, really strong tech transfer out of the universities, events like this, centers like Kaida. Um, are essential, right? Because the students and the faculty, they're the idea generation, they're the, they're the engine. Um, you, you also just need a, uh, a, a strong venture capital structure. You just need to be open to um, all of the opportunities. And it's not gonna work everywhere, right? Some of it's just luck. Some of it's the right success is happening. And um, the only thing you can do as I think kind of a public top-down level is set yourself up to be in the best position to take advantage of those when they come along. Frank had his diagram earlier of the missing pieces and such in, in the, the sort of generation of um, uh, uh, ML or AI companies in BC. I don't know enough to say like what's missing or what's not there, but um, it's something that needs bottom up and top down. Yeah, Frank. So I'll go out there and be controversial again, I guess, and and uh, and you know, you know, obviously, I was one of the one of the welcoming uh, parties uh, to that, you know, to to say hi to Matt when he came to town and said Amazon's coming and so on and so forth. This is this is great, but I I think the the one of the attractions of BC to me is not actually probably not dissimilar to the large corporations that are starting to figure out that maybe BC is a, a, an interesting place to be. Uh, um, is a couple of things. One, uh, it's a bit green, green fields here. Uh, BC has not overfit to, and UBC has not overfit to um, the, the short-termist, deep learning based, you know, uh, you know, let's just regress the crap out of everything style of machine learning. We'll solve every problem in this way and, you know, disrupt every business process with, you know, um, <laughs> regression and classification out the wazoo. Um, there is a diversity of thought at UBC, which I think is very, very, uh, very attractive. Uh, and, uh, and I would, I would go so far as to say that, um, that the, the, that historically the, the, the generation or, uh, um, like these kind of clusters of, of economic activity, like a, like 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 the Bay Area, like other, um, other uh, you know, like the 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 lab based uh, companies in in, in Boston, <clears throat> are really m more about organic innovation at the local startup level than they are about big corporations coming in and hoovering up all the talent. So in in some sense, you know, I think maybe Amazon coming into Vancouver is actually not a good thing for the the probability of a local. Um, 
uh, explosion of, 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 you know, economic opportunity, these sorts of things, right? Uh, I think that, you know, not to, not to toot my own horn, despite your uh, rather caustic comments about my, my startup, which couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, um, I, I think that real transformation and massive economic change comes from, you know, the kinds of, oh, wait a second, actually something different is happening in, in this group. And I'm, you know, I'll, 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 I'm, I'm betting my life on my research group, right? You know, I could go off and work in Amazon and make a hell of a lot more money than I do right here. And, and certainly more than I'm making in my startup right now. But I, I think that the, that, you know, the diversity of thought that remains in BC and at UBC in particular, with respect to methodology, techniques, these sorts of things, and you're, you're one of them, Kevin, you know this, right, uh, is actually the strength from which our e ecosystem will grow, provided that um, not all of our talent is hoovered up by high paying jobs or less well high paying jobs because they're in BC in, you know, large corporation, large corporations, uh, you know, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. But I, I, th I think diversity, startups, you know, actual technological innovation rather than business process, uh, you know, <laughs> interruption. And uh, that's where real value comes from. And it's here. My group is putting it out. And there are others that, that are doing it too. I'm conscious of the time here. We've uh, got an unwieldy large panel and uh, many good questions coming from the audience. So I'm going to, uh, rather than going around the table on the rest of this question, I'm going to just take a few audience questions to make sure we don't miss them. So. But let me ask you to keep your remarks brief and I'll maybe take two or three remarks per question just so that we, we get to cover a few of them and we'll try to rotate through the people we haven't heard from yet. Um, the, the first question, that there's been a lot of upvotes here and, and the audience members, please keep upvoting things or asking questions as we go if there's, if there's more you want to hear about. Um, we have a question from Ivan asking, what are your thoughts on the brain drain out of BC, startup migration to the Bay Area and Canadian startup buyout by large US companies? Is this a natural process or something that should be prevented to stimulate growth in BC? I think we just kind of heard a little bit about what Frank thinks about that, unless, unless you're going to say something different. Um, really quickly, Frank, what's your different thing to say? I, I think that, that Matt hit on it, and uh, Evgeny is a bit to blame. Uh, so I, I, I think that, uh, I, you know, I'll just go ahead and pull these, pull these guys in by being controversial again and say, uh, you know, um, the local VC community is still not really up to understanding like what the risk profile and re and characteristic of, of deep tech startups looks like. And I think there's a little bit of short-termism in the top-down sort of governmental organizations that, that would support the, the growth of small local enterprise rather than yeah. Let, let's hear from some other voices. Aline? I think we need to encourage, uh, the, the government needs to put up programs that encourage students uh, to spin off companies based on work that they've done in their undergrad and graduate work, uh, especially with researchers. So this needs to be something that we really put high priority on so that we could retain the talent in BC. Yeah, I, can, I, can I chime in on something? I, I think yeah, there's a huge piece missing in the, the ecosystem here and it's, I call it uh, healthcare DARPA. So um, for those of you who are familiar with how, how DARPA works, you know, programs like autonomous vehicles, you say that there's a military need and you give money to partnerships between universities and companies to try to build those technologies. With government as first customer, often, you know, licensing agreements to prevent the technology from drifting too far away or outside your control. And Canada just doesn't have this. They don't have this mindset that you, you need to actually fund professors to work with companies and at a scale. I mean, these programs aren't cheap. You can't do it for a $15,000, you know, internship program. That's not what this looks like. It looks like a serious investment, orders of tens or hundreds of millions of dollars for a program. And it, the same sort of that, that VC sort of lack of boldness and lack of really trying to do something big, it exists in our government too, and it's a major problem. You, you've got to come and say, it's, it's expensive. Frank's time is valuable, right? Um, it, it's well, let's, 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 I mean, not to, not to jump in on you, but you know, Kevin and I 
we, you know, you know, I'm basically run by DARPA. My lab is run by DARPA. I have, you know, several million dollars in DARPA funding, and it's impossible to get in the Canadian interest in the in the Canadian ecosystem. Thus, why I want the startup thing to bring in money, and that's the mechanism for funding. And there's a really interesting alternative model that can happen here. But that's the model that has to happen. Otherwise, it doesn't exist here. You're totally I have the same thing. Like when I was a prof professor, I had IARPA money. Same thing. I'm working for the U.S. government and I'm building technologies at Google and other smaller startups that are hoovering up on uh, internet video analysis. Where is BC? This is not doing it. And they, they, there's, there's, there needs to be that vision that says we're willing to spend $100 million, literally that amount, and maybe nothing will come of it. Okay, You'd be ready for that. It's super risky. But if you do that enough times, something huge will come of it. And you need to put in place those structures where government will say, we want this. If there's actually a thing we need and we don't know how to do it, companies partner with academia, go build that thing and we'll buy it. And you can maintain the rights to resell that to other people. This type of, of, of thought leadership needs to happen. It has to be those stakeholders who say, okay, I, wa I wanna improve patient outcomes and Here's the type of thing that I think we need to do that. I have a program manager who comes from Ministry of Health who actually understands, like, again, Matt was talking about, like, people you need around the ecosystem. Right? You need people who can say, there's a program that we need to run that will deliver value if you can build this thing. And again, fund it at a serious level, not $10,000. Okay? And give it to academics in partnership with industry. Don't give it to industry. Don't give it to academics because we know what they'll do, right? Each of them sort of has their own angles. But if you say together, you have to build this thing and we'll buy it if you do, I think this could really transform things. And I think these questions are like, can you keep people in Canada and can you keep them in BC? If you do things like this, it can help. Uh, so, okay. don't, so I don't want to put you on the spot to represent all of the BC government, but, uh, but you do have the government perspective on this panel. So I wonder what you think about what you're hearing. Yeah, I, I think that's that's spot on. That sort of data model, I think, is definitely where we need to go. Um, combined with some regulatory framework that keeps the IP under control of Canadians, and so we, we don't have this trend of things disappearing across the border. Um, other things government needs to bring to bear here is to make sure there's a policy framework and a regulatory framework to actually support the, the use of these tools out in the, in the economy. And I could... Please. If I could just chime in, because... Uh... A lot of the, our funding is coming actually from, from from the federal government, and it's I totally agree with Greg. Um, it's not enough. I mean, it need, needs a lot more money in order to invest in, in those things. And the, the capital that we are actually operating is in the dozen of million. It's not it's not as big as you normally need for very big challenges that are looking far ahead. That's why it's a little bit driven into uh, into the things that we want to do in short term because that's achievable with the, with the amount of money that we have. But indeed, for bigger transformative things, you need big investment. And we see ourselves as co-investors. So we're not the only one investor. So the real VC investment in the region is the thing that will probably drive towards these outcomes. One of the so, things that's really healthy in Seattle and when I worked in the Bay is when you work at the big companies, you lose employees all the time to their startup ideas that don't fit into uh, the plans of the big company. Right, and so that you, I totally agree with Greg and and uh, everybody else that you just need to have that infrastructure in place so that people can try these ideas, fund them at the scale that's actually realistic, and then uh, try them. Right, and um, that's that's just completely necessary. Yeah. Um, so let, let's try to do as we're going to go a little bit over since this is going uh, um, so so well and. Um, let me try to get to another couple of audience questions before we have to wrap up. I think very quickly, what's your view on how BC compares with the rest of Canada in terms of the number of startups, developers, AI rollout? What's your sense? Are we a laggard? Are we a leader? Are we, are we lagging in some ways and leading in others? I think we're leading. Element AI did a study um, and counted the number of startups just a couple of years ago and, and Vancouver fared quite well. You know. I think second to Toronto ahead of Montreal in terms of the raw number of startups. I think that as others have said though, there's a, there's a more complex story, which is that when we try to hire senior you know, machine learning engineers, people who have built ML systems before a couple of times, that talent's hard to find, very hard to find in Vancouver, to be honest. 
you try to find product managers who have built AI products, who really know how to work with researchers and engineers, how to take research ideas that are risky, build them into products, harder to find. And I think those are the parts of the ecosystem that are, are really lacking, I feel. It's, the, it's because we're young, right? We haven't been good for very long. And if we're good for another 10 years and those people stay, then we'll be in a strong position. So I think it's just that the amount of time that we've actually been good at this is, is not that long in Vancouver. Maybe we'll do this. Does this argue against the importance of the kind of top-down approach? I mean, Canada has a national AI strategy, $100 million. You know, BC has gotten less than 2% of that money. Um, you know, we've never had a, a targeted funding program for the BC government. You know, we're doing pretty well anyway. I mean, should we just uh, do these things just sort of happen by themselves? I think uh, someone on the panel said that it was, it was a bit of serendipity when you do have a lot of these uh, factors coming together. Uh, you have, you know, you, you have the opportunities that the larger companies create. You have uh, uh, the opportunity that the government might create in terms of some of the frameworks that you have, and you have extremely good uh, uh, universities or or uh, educational institutions. Um, you know, I, I think that all of these things are coming up in grade, but we are a pretty small community just generally. I mean, we're a small population here in, in Vancouver, and we um, we haven't had the tradition of of um, of innovation here. I mean, we're a resource-based economy to, to, or have been for a large, to a large degree. Uh, flipping that around, as, as we can see in Alberta, is not an easy task. And uh, that, that's what's required. Okay, so, so another question that we're uh, seeing in the chat is um, your thoughts on ethics. So um, I guess we've talked a lot about sort of the, the pragmatics of, of AI and the, the economics of it, but are there areas where you think that AI should not be used in your respective industry? Right. I really like what Douglas said in response to my you know, advocacy for a healthcare DARPA is that it's super important that government sets you know, ethics, boundaries, rules and regulations that are clear. And that's a super important thing. And I, I think that that's what you know, is scary about many areas of AI is that around social media and advertising and data collection, those, those rules and regulations are very, you know, have trailed behind. And I think for, for many sectors like healthcare, it's super important that that gets done properly by people who are experts. And I, I love that, that sort of statement. And I, th I think it needs to happen very cerebrally. Like we need to think about it and, and implement it up front. Uh, also, we need to make sure that none of our models that we build unwillingly discriminate uh, and are fair. Uh, so I think these, these are our areas that I think would need a lot of attention before uh, AI could be really used. I'll be careful of forbidding AI being used in, uh, in some places, but uh, I think in general, probably we should have to look at, uh, at some general principles that will govern it, like for example, full transparency and traceability and um, elements that can allow um, that kind of control that can be put both in the models, but also on the data, because there's a lot of focus on uh, on this as well. So I, I would rather say for some open principles that will allow this transparency to be established and controlled and verified and validated uh, will be probably the most important rather than say, no, don't get into, into this domain at all. So we have a, a question uh, specifically directed to Frank, who, who the audience feels they haven't heard enough from. That he's uh, giving the most spice to our panel. Um, so, uh, some uh, presumably students are, are interested in knowing what uh, made you change your career from startups to academia, and uh, you know what you found challenging about that, and uh, what do you think made you successful? Uh, there's some question about whether or not I've really been successful, you know, I'm, uh, <laughs> I was going to leave that open for you to, <laughs> yeah, to I, I, you know, home ownership in uh, BC is a challenging uh, proposition, even for those who've been moderately successful. Uh, <clears throat> um, so uh, very quickly, uh, why go from startups to academia? I think a big prize versus little prize, the discount factors that I was talking about were a big, big, are, are a big part of it. Uh, if you really want to go for the big prize, it's very difficult to get that uh, uh, funded on on uh, on 
short-term sort of valuation things. So I went off and worked on big prize stuff, tr truly transformative technology. And now I'm going back because I think actually we've done some crazy, crazy cool stuff, which is yet to be recognized. And I actually think will form the foundation for BC's tech explosion, right? Uh, so that, there you go. That's the truth. That's, that's, that's what I think. The stuff we're doing is going to be absolutely transformative. And if I can get people like Greg to, to, to believe and come back out of Borealis and go back to being the AI vision researcher that he, that, that he was and join up and these sorts of things, we can make something absolutely amazing happen here. Uh, so, so in the tough part is you, you know, you cut your salary by a factor of five and you, you know, play with kids that are 10 years younger than you. Uh, uh, and, you know, then you're 10 years behind and everybody looks at you and they say, oh my God, you look so much older than Aline. It's disgusting, even though you're kind of at the same academic phase. Uh, you know, uh, so there's some social issues that are, that are, that are problematic there, but Academia is a good place to sit if you want to work on fundamental problems with high risk reward profiles. And, you know, hey, it's going to be fun when we come back out and uh, show the world what we can do. And that's what's happening right now. You know, Frank, you're leaving me uh, wondering about, you know, you've contrasted this sort of big picture, transformative, risky stuff with this sort of short termism. And, you know, the startups that you've been involved in, you know, have operated on, on short term horizons, right? I mean, they've been startups, they, you've already gone through several of them, these aren't like 20 year moonshots. So, so, so what, what distinction are you drawing between what you're calling short term and what you're calling, you know, transformative work that a startup can do? Uh, so, sorry, I, I, now I feel like I'm taking too much time. I really don't want to, to, to speak over this. So I would, I, I, just to, to, to reinforce the, the, the story, the early stuff, yes, was startups, right? I, I grew up a, a poor farm kid from Illinois. I had no money at all. I needed to make some money. So I went off and I couldn't be a graduate student. So I went off and I started companies and made some money, right? And of course, I built short-term stuff. Of course, content-based vision, you know, visual search on the on the internet, the first image search engine on the internet. Cool. Yeah, that's that, that was that was interesting. In fact, Greg doesn't even know that. Uh, you know, Interfolio, who cares? It's a business model, right? I, I don't care. Sports gambling companies providing, you know, it, you know, information to the Indian subcontinent. Who cares? It's not transformative. It's, it's, it is low value, you know, let's use deep learning to solve the next X problem, right? That, yes, we can make money doing that and I can pitch that sort of thing. And what, what I'm saying is then going back into academia, that's where you work on the really transformative stuff. And the startups that I'm, that I'm involved in right now are using this transformative technology and in, in a way that has, you know, short-term profitability in mind, for sure, absolutely, it's monetizable. But there is this, there is this, this discount factor thing, and I think it is different here than it is, say, for instance, in the Bay Area, where you can go get, you know, ten million dollars to work on a long-term idea in industry in a startup, whereas you can't do that here right now. Right, that it's it's very 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 difficult to do that because people are sort of that the, the the risk reward the discount factors involved and the understanding of the upside on the other side is just missing still. Uh, so I see a couple of our panelists sort of bouncing around. Does anyone want to get in on that idea, or should I move to the next question? I think that uh, for you know one of the things that I would say to students who are uh, working in in towards a graduate degree. And I think that's something I faced when I was doing mine and I did my training in statistics and machine learning. Uh, but yet here I am in, in the healthcare sector working in a health, health department. And I think one of the, the desires that I have is to, is to work really at the, at the application level. And, but I still wanted to stay in that research domain. So, so directing into one specific area of application and doing a postdoc in that area and really developing your expertise. If you want to stay in academia, but work close to an application, that would be a good way to go. Okay, so I'm going to do one last audience question and, uh, and then wrap up in five minutes. Um, so, so our last sort of highly upvoted question uh, is again about the BC AI ecosystem and it's about next steps. So um, Alan writes, the BC AI ecosystem is healthy, but it's siloed. What do we need to get to the next level? Do we need a di distributed AI institute, networking, academia, industry, government, and NGOs? You know, do we need some kind of top-down government policy like, like uh, we've been talking about before? Do we need serendipity? Uh, do we need more bold risk-taking? Uh, what, what are the missing ingredients that you think would take BC to the next level? 
I'll, I'll bite probably all of that. And as Greg said, a little bit of time and maturity, right? Because again, it's you, you have to build up the uh, um, culture of people who have tried these things and failed at them, uh, had small successes, uh, are willing to think, think, think bigger. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, I, I don't think there is a magic bullet. Again, if there was, every you know municipality on earth would figure out a way to become Silicon Valley. And uh, so I think you need all of it. And then you also need to not get discouraged that it might take several years and to track the wins that you get and you know everything from what I'm doing and uh, to the healthcare stuff to uh, you know what Frank is working on. Those are all ingredients. There's not like a monolithic. Uh, option here. It's the diversity of ideas and approaches to technology that builds one of these places. It's not like there's one way and that's what really does it. So, and it's the crossover, people training in one, learning in the other, accumulating diversity in their background and their, their ways of thinking. Right, that, that seems a little, I mean, this is the second time you've, you've said this thing about, you know, otherwise every municipality could become Silicon Valley. You know, we're not moose jaw, right? We do have a, a position on the global ranking. I, I happen to have a lot of family in moose jaw, and I think you know we could we could do some things there also. But uh, no, I was right, thinking Schenectady, New York, because it has a funny name. But then I thought I'd pick a Canadian one. Yeah, um, <laughs> no, you're you're totally right. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen everywhere. And Vancouver has so uh, it's a good pushback. Vancouver has the essential elements for it, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't be investing there. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's got the key elements very clearly. Uh, it's got the great universities. Um, it does probably need better venture, venture capital environment. There's probably things in government, everything that everybody listed could be improved, but yeah, of course the base elements are there in Vancouver. It, it's just obvious, right? Um, you're also very closely connected when the border is open to, uh, places like Seattle where, there are a bunch of people who have tried these things at big companies, at small companies, failed, succeeded, everything in between, right? Um, and also a lot of venture capital money, right? So uh, I think the key ingredients are there. Um, I, I think you just, you know, you need all the other things to fall into place. What do some others think? Evgeny? Yeah, maybe something that will be helpful. I'm not saying that that will be critical, but certainly will be helpful. And I have seen it happening in some of the other provinces is, all of the AI companies are starving of data, so they don't actually have access to data, especially that's in the healthcare domain. Uh, so if there is some mechanism of being able, whether this is through synthetic data, like for example, Alberta is using a lot of synthetic data algorithms, but um, if there's a mechanism of uh, supplying companies with necessary data to be able to do their work, that will be an interesting push in, in one way or another. Kyle, what are you thinking? We haven't heard from you for a while. Well, you know, I I I I really do agree with with uh, with Matt uh, and, and many other speakers here that it really does take an awful lot to 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 quote unquote uh, foment a, a Silicon Valley, and and I don't think that we can at this point in time. There are there are times in in history where things happen and then they and then and then they grow. Uh, I, whatever happens here will be different. And, and it will be, it will have a character that is different. Uh, it might be uh, Frank's uh, new revolutionary uh, development uh, that springs forth that will, you know, create the next nexus here in Vancouver. Um, but whatever it is, it'll need money and it'll need people <laughs> and it'll need a problem. And so, you know, those three things are, 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 are essential. Uh, in Vancouver, we don't actually have a large number of large companies. We have, you know, a very, a very, very few large companies. Uh, so if Toronto has a hundred, uh, you know, Calgary has ten, Vancouver has one. So I mean, it's almost, uh, well, maybe Calgary may may be in a different position too soon. But, but the, you know, the, the issue here is that when you have that kind of, of, um, of mass, you do generate gravity, and when you have the gravity, you do get all of the, uh, uh, of the um, uh, orbital. Or, or, orbital data scientists who actually begin to uh, gravitate uh, towards that uh, center, but we don't. And, and I think that uh, that's actually one of the necessary things is to, is to grow all those three things, is the, is the, uh, the ability to actually uh, uh, draw uh, industry in uh, to create those, uh, that, that base of capital that you need to actually uh, develop uh, 
um, a, a large community of, um, uh, of, of people who can um, explore and innovate. And right now, uh, I mean, we, we have a very robust healthcare system, um, but it's, it's also one that is, is, is not uh, sort of generating that kind of capital in Canada, it's actually using capital. So, you know, so the, you know, there, there's a, there's a big tension here, I think, in actually being able to uh, create that next step or, you know, not the next Silicon Valley, but, you know, create a Vancouver that's, that's very unique in its, in its, uh, in its approach to this. Um, I also yeah, think that, we're going to have to leave it there. We're, we're at the end of our time. Uh, and in fact, we're, we're well over the end of our time that uh, you guys had such good things to say. We, uh, we, we took a bit of a, uh, a detour, but uh, let me uh, end just by thanking all of you. I think, you know, as, as all good panels do, you guys have left us with more questions than answers, but uh, I, I think uh, really a, a diversity of perspectives that have shed a lot of light on uh, the, the current state of things in BC and uh, some promising ways forward. Um, let me uh, let everyone who's here um, know or remember the industry showcases our next event. So, so please uh, go back to, to gather and, and make it over there and we'll, uh, and see if you can find one of the panelists there if you want to buttonhole them and uh, ask them questions about uh, the outrageous things they said on the panel. So, so once again, um, thanks everyone and uh, see you at the next event. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you.